Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we have a special treat, uh, a weekend treat for everybody. Uh, uh, External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jashankar uh, on his latest book. Uh, it's already um, it's already hitting bestseller lists, and uh, it it's a it's a unique blend of uh, literature, strategy, and forecast. Uh, so. I will, uh, I will kick off with the most obvious question. <coughs> after, after the India way, why does Bharat matter? And why this book? And why now? OK, that's, that's three questions. Uh, OK, so let me start with why the book, and then maybe come uh, to the other two. Uh, I think why the book, essentially, I wrote it because uh, in the course of, you know, t interacting with people over the last few years, uh, including from, you know, from propagating the previous book, uh, I developed a stronger conviction that everybody, uh, certainly all Indians, uh, need to take greater interest in foreign policy. Because uh, uh, somehow, I mean, it's, it's, it's very common uh, all over the world. Uh, there is a belief that foreign policy is something complicated, esoteric. It should be left to, you know, a certain set of people to deal with, uh, which is not entirely without some justification. Uh, but uh, uh, to me, a number of events happened. Why? it's important for the average person to get more involved with foreign policy, certainly pay more attention to foreign policy. And some of those events, if you look, uh, I mean, the one which I've spent a lot of time in the book explaining was the COVID. Uh, that COVID showed that if you were a person in some remote part of India with absolutely no interest in the world, the world had decided not to leave you alone. The world actually entered your doorstep. In fact, it came inside your home. So uh, the idea that there is a world and there is home, uh, there is that very messy thing out there. But you know, I'm OK because I'm in my bubble. It's necessary for us to put that behind us. Now, I'm giving you a very extreme example, which is COVID. But in a variety of ways, uh, other things matter. I mean, a second example I've cited is actually uh, the Ukraine conflict. And, you know, frankly, the price of petrol in the petrol pump, which affects every one of us, which would have actually driven, uh, fueled inflation. Uh, it wouldn't have just fueled our vehicles, it would have fueled inflation in this country. Had we not made uh, certain decisions uh, uh, in that regard. So that's like a second example. Uh, I would, you know, in different ways, uh, it could be, it, it could even be Indians who travel abroad and more and more Indians uh, travel uh, every year. I mean, if you look at the number of passports uh, that we issue, uh, these are rising at a very uh, substantial rate. Uh, uh, I think last year we issued about 13 million new passports. Uh, if one looks at Indians or people of Indian origin living and working abroad, uh, they are today estimated at about 32, 33 million people. Uh, when we had that, you know, when we had a lockdown situation, uh, if you look at the number of Indians who happened at that particular point of time to be abroad in some form, uh, you know, people uh, people who were uh, working in cruise shipping and merchant shipping and airlines and hotels who had gone out as blue collar workers. Uh, we have today about, I think, 1.3 million students out at any given point of time. So the uh, the Indians who, who go out, you know, should also be aware of that, you know, foreign, something can happen in the world. And frankly, their families and their near and dear need to know it too. Yeah. So uh, 
I mean, this is a long way of saying that really globalization today between globalization and technology, because there's a se segment I've also devoted to the dangers uh, from the normal. That, uh, you know, there are choices we make without even thinking about it. You know, what are the games and the apps we download? What are the phones that we use? You know, where where is a who's collecting our data? Who's harvesting our data? What are they doing with it? And are you comfortable with where your data is? Uh, so if you put all this together, the uh, essence of the, a long explanation, which you must read the book to fully grasp, uh, is that uh, uh, you know the uh, even people who may not think they are they're professionally connected with foreign policy should take an interest uh, uh, in foreign policy. So that's the first question. The second question, why Bharat matters? Uh, now, there are two parts. One is the Bharat word and one is the matters part. So the Bharat part was really uh, the uh, 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 kind, you know, a uh, thought there that we have in the last decade especially uh, evolved uh, in a way in which we are more comfortable, uh, I would say, expressing our cultural civilizational personality. Uh, if you look uh, today at the nature of our uh, thinking, uh, our representation, uh, uh, in many ways even our activities, it's more grounded, it's more rooted than it was. It is less elitist uh, than it used to be uh, before. Uh, and uh, that uh, if you use Bharat in a way as a short form for a certain mindset of, uh, uh, you know, confidence, of uh, self-assurance, of self-reliance. So uh, all of that is part of the transition, really the transformation of the last decade. The matters is because it is making an impact on the world. Because, you know, while I've said you should look at foreign policy because there are all those problems. I don't want people to think that we should all be over anxious about the world. I mean, the world equally has a lot of opportunities. So the matters is, you know, the more you learn, discover your own strengths, uh, the more you are actually able to uh, grasp the opportunities uh, uh, out there in the world. So you you just spoke about uh, Bharat as uh, a civilizational state and embracing the civilizational state or rather but uh, you have in in your in the book you have also spoken about india no longer being the prisoner of the past uh -huh. and um but using the past with lessons for the future how much of this is political distancing how much of it is what you call objective audit of the past? Well, you know, the objective audit conducted by the people of India has led to political distancing. Yeah. I mean, the people of India looked at the last 60, 70 years and decided in 2014 that they wanted a different, uh, you know, they, they wanted uh, a different uh, political thinking. Uh, and a different outlook to governance and uh, to their own future. So uh, I wouldn't separate the two uh, as much as your question uh, would suggest. Uh, when you say, uh, you know, uh, distancing from the past, uh, I, I've i seen it more like an evolution and a debate. Mm -hmm. Because even in the past, you know, it's not like history, good history began in 2014. I mean, there were many things before 2014. But there are many things before 2014, which were, uh, which we ourselves had airbrushed uh, at that time. You know, one of uh, uh, my discoveries, I mean, I mean, partly because, again, uh, uh, a lot of it was written by meeting people, by talking to people, by, uh, you know, you had to pick up a subject, so you actually spend some time researching that subject. So if you look, I, you know, I have a chapter called The Roads Not Taken. Okay. The Roads Not Taken actually addresses itself in a very 
you know, it's it's not exhaustive, but it's illustrative. I looked at three relationships which today, uh, even now, dominate our foreign policy debates. The relationship with China, the relationship with US, and the relationship with Pakistan. Now, we were all brought up in the belief that the choices which were made in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s were inevitable, they were logical, they were probably the, they weren't even a choice. I mean, they were a natural flow of wise thinking and the strategic circumstances of that era. In reality, in every case, there were actually uh, choices, there were alternatives, there was a debate. Now, uh, and it wasn't just, you know, that there was a debate. In many cases, today, a lot of things which we say were said at that time when it was happening. You know, so if, let us say, uh, I mean, I, I give the example of China. Did, you know, after 1962, naturally, there was a big debate in this country. Uh, did uh, uh, Nehru get China? Did Nehru reach China right or wrong? I mean, uh, political debates are not that complicated. So, uh, the, um, uh, the conventional explanation uh, was, you know, well, Nehru kind of got it right, but, you know, the Chinese were must have believed they were very disingenuous. And so you had this word, the Chinese betrayal. Okay. So the Chinese were actually uh, uh, people who had... Uh, who had other intentions, but, uh, you know, the rest of us all believe a certain narrative. Now, in fact, in 1950, if you look at, you know, this Nehru uh, Patel uh, notes uh, on that, Ma many of the macro assessments of China uh, are, are articulated by Patel as early as 1950. Uh, I mean, uh, remember, as late as 1962, even 1963, this country was still not thinking of two fronts. You know, in, in fact, if you see, uh, uh, the after 62, we reach out to Pakistan thinking we can now cut a deal with Pakistan so that we have to face the Chinese threat. Now, Patel is telling you in 1950, saying, wake up, Does we already have a two-front issue. So I flagged that because uh, somewhere we have, it's not like we've forgotten our own history. We often were not taught our own history. Uh, many of us knowingly looked away. Many of us never knew it. So that's one example. I could give you a very different example. That's US. Yes. Where... Uh, you know, in a way, it's connected with China, that you have people uh, in the uh, cabinet at that time. Uh, we're talking here of early, uh, no, no, early middle 50s, okay, who essentially are asking uh, Nehru, and not asking Nehru, they're saying it in public, uh, uh, saying, look, why are we taking up China's cause to the extent that we are alienating the Americans? Uh, so, I mean, it's one thing if we have issues with the Americans, but must we actually alienate the Americans for the sake of China? So, uh, if, you know, if you look at two of the, in the roads not taken, I've, I've essentially used uh, like uh, snapshots of four eminent people of that era, uh, Patel, uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, uh, B.R. Ambedkar, and Menu Masani. Now, uh, B. R. Ambedkar, for example, he speaks about the alienation of America. That you know, it was in fact, at, you know, even Patel has concerns uh, as uh, early as 1949-1950, saying, you know, uh, why is it that uh, you know, the U you know we can benefit from a better U.S. relationship? Uh, we need the U.S., you know, for a variety of reasons. Why are we sort of pushing away the U.S.? Why are we irritating them on matters which are actually not our core national interest? And that's where the ideological 
character you know uh, of the government uh, there comes out and of course uh, in pakistan you know uh, the the classic example uh, is uh, shama prasad mukherjee uh, now the reason why i because you know he he cautions about the uh, <clears throat> liquidation of minorities in pakistan and everything that he predicted at that time which people felt he was a scaremonger then has come to pass in the years that have happened now why have i put it because if i had told any of you could you name for me ministers of the indian cabinet who resigned because they had differences on foreign policy i'm pretty sure most of you before we had this talk today would be stumped for an answer people have actually i mean if you look at ambedkar's resignation foreign policy is one of the factors so it's important for us to know our past so i'm not rejecting the past i'm actually saying let's have a good audit about our past as well let's have a more honest audit about our past and by the way let's have a honest audit about our distant past as well that you know uh, instead of uh, uh, we have a complicated layered history which becomes a civilization let's not be in denial of our civilization because it suited people's political calculations in uh, 1950 you uh, the one part of this book which is uh, which is very interesting because it takes over from what your previous book is which is the reference to a very close reference to the ramayan uh in so many ways the mahabharat is a more is a storied uh, epic much more uh, connected with state craft ramayan not so much mm-hmm. why did you use ramayan Uh, and w- what are the connections that you drew from the ramayan for india's foreign policy well uh, to be honest a variety of reasons one i had already used the mahabharat in the first book so so you want you want to be a di- little bit different to i i was talk i was talking at the release i think of the marathi i forget either marathi or gujarati edition of my first book and somebody stood up out there someone like one of you and actually challenged me to do an exercise on vikramaya so i accepted that challenge and once i started applying a certain um, perspective you know i started looking at ramayan like a political science international relations diplomatic person and then you could see because you know this is why epics are epics that you could actually see pretty much a lot of what is today you know what would be the key objectives of a foreign policy of of diplomacy well they are very much out there you know how to build a coalition how to conduct regime change how to you know uh, sort of uh, how to have plan b's how to have insiders who in a in a way who who kind of give you a much more informationized environment uh, with about which you are dealing uh, so uh, you know uh, how how to actually uh, i would say uh, build brand and intimidate people how to deter people you know how, where do you cut your deals now every you know if if i were to just give you list out these and say look would any of you differ this is like diplomacy 101 but this diplomacy 101 is actually uh, permeates uh, the rama that even even the idea of a rules based order you know after all what is ram rajya ram rajya is about a rules based order so the idea of a rules based order the idea of you know of uh, even global commons that if you you know what takes lord ram into the forest if you think of the forest as global commons where the good citizenry of the world is 
is uh, occupying or traversing through and which is unpro you know unprotected and at danger from predatory powers so you need you know someone who will take some responsibility for the global commons so you find me a, a modern situation i can try and give you a ramayan analogy now the nice thing about it is in this country if the moment you st start using ramayan analogies immediately bingo everybody gets it you know you can you can have a difficult you know explanation you know we we need to construct the quad because you, we have a range of countries with similar interests and we have global commons we do global good uh, now if i were to give some ramayan type analogy immediately doesn't doesn't understanding so even as a communication tool uh, it's extremely effective so i will take you back to your question your point about the global commons and global goods because it's not merely in the book that you spoke about it you were actually one of your first statements as foreign minister in the un in 2019 um and you it, you were addressing the group of multi on multilateralism and you spoke about yes and you spoke about uh, the kindle burger trap but when and so bringing you back to the modern day as the us is rethinking its own economic engagement with the world or rather its own economic gen generosity and in fact uh, its traditional position as the guarantor of global goods um, it's redefining its notion of global supremacy, not merely in trade, but in tech, supply chains, etc. Is there a space opening up for India, for powers like India? And I refer to your statement on this because is there something that we are missing as we grow, as we become a more multilateral power? And are there responsibilities that we bring to the table? Uh, I think the short answer is yes, but I don't think we are missing. Okay. Uh, I think we are waking up to it. We are even doing some of it. And again, you know, when we, when I said that it's important for people, even unconnected in their professional or daily life with foreign policy, to know about foreign policy, part of it is that uh, uh, understanding of the responsibility that if we today, let us say. Uh, send, uh, you know, a first responder team to an earthquake in Turkey, or we say we are doing uh, an HADR mission to Mozambique or, I don't know, Fiji or something. Uh, people have to understand, it's important to explain to our own people, why are we doing it? That, so, uh, we are today, uh, I mean, in fact, if you see pretty much from 2015, every year, uh, you know, we've had one major, at least one major uh, operation uh, uh, and one major sort of first responder type operation. So you could have the Yemen's, you know, civil war. Some of them are rescue come response. Hmm? Uh, but you had Yemen, you had South Sudan, you had the Nepal earthquake, you had, of course, the conflict once. Uh, you, you had, uh, in fact, Maldives when the water supply system broke down. You had Sri Lanka when the mudslides happened. So it, it's, a, it's today like a drill. In fact, not is it just a drill. We have even created a force. You know, one of the innovations uh, of the Modi government when they first came into office was to actually raise a force called the national, uh, rap, you know, the uh, the uh, response, Rapid. disaster response uh, force. So uh, we have responsibilities uh, which will grow because uh, the old order, which was substantially underwritten and underpinned by a certain uh, uh, expectation and assumption about the United States, those expectations and assumptions are no longer wholly valid. They've not completely disappeared, 
but they definitely are not what they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, if you see, uh, I mean, the case of the Quad, uh, I mean, when when the tsunami, the 2004 tsunami happened, the I mean, uh, the the U.S. was, you know, uh, was present at a fairly rapid rate uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, today, I'm not sure where some contingency like that to happen, that you would actually get that same kind of response with that kind of speed. So, you know, which means you have two options, you know, either somebody picks up the slack or nobody does. Now, I would argue that it's sensible for a country like India. I mean, we can't pick up all the slack, but we can pick up some of the slack. Uh, along with others who can who can uh, contribute, so there is in a variety of areas today, even in diplomacy. You know, if you want today an outcome at an important conference, there was a time when there were frankly backroom deals, uh, if not actually, uh, let us say, a strong uh, preference expressed by one power or two power or three. Even that today requires uh, much greater confabulation and much more complex deal making than it used to be in the past. Now, uh, one of the changes again here is uh, how much more active we have been in all the global uh, discussions uh, to, to, I mean, definitely to advance our interest, but also to find some kind of collective uh, landing landing point. So I think it's part of changing the world order. And in that change in the world order, uh, we, look, you can't, in, in this decade, you know, if you use, say, GDP as a metric, OK, we move from 11 to 5. If you use activity as a metric, probably the numbers may be even sharper. So it's part of the changing global order. You can't go up the ladder and then say, I won't you know, I'll, I'm comfortable doing what I was doing when I was a uh, lesser or a smaller uh, wow. quality. So uh, you, uh, on the changing global order, you've spoken a lot on the Quad. In fact, you have an entire, almost an entire chapter devoted to it. Not almost, so and actually entire. a chapter. And uh, you've also spoken a lot about the I2U2 IMAC. Yes. As one, as a as a in, a, in a sense, not only a game changer, but you also referred to it as a return to history. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, you're literally, uh, you want to, we want to literally remake this region with echoes of our past, but what is the future that you're looking at? What is the future that you see? Well, you know, uh, it's a strange thing to say, but obviously, because India has such a past, a large part of the future is going to look like the past. Uh, meaning, if in our past, in our history, we had a footprint which extended, let us say, from the eastern coast of China to the eastern coast of Africa, at least. And, you know, I'm not even looking at uh, traversing the Arabian Peninsula and reaching the Mediterranean and uh, 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 southern Europe. Now, it's natural uh, as, uh, uh, you know, as the economy grows, as capabilities grow, as uh, also, you know, there's a greater mobility and a greater, uh, I would say, a, a more global workplace, that a lot of these traditions and a lot of these because, you know, after all, what are traditions? I mean, they are a kind of a muscle memory that, you know, we've done it before. We are comfortable out there. There's some sign we were there. Those people out there have some understanding of us. They know us. So uh, it's it's uh, what you are seeing is actually exactly that, you know, the uh, a much tighter circle now, a second circle coming, a third circle coming, uh, and uh, more and more activity on on either side the new mandala as you call yes it. the new, the new mandala in a way and if you if i were to sort of put it in a sort of schema 
if you take the four directions, so if you look at act east, act east actually led to the Indo-Pacific. And once we, you know, the more we we uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the the more we deal with the Indo-Pacific, the more uh, in a way is uh, the the traditions and uh, uh, the goodwill of the past also starts to make itself felt. So. Uh, you can look at a country like Vietnam today, I mean, or uh, as I said, uh, you know, even Japan, even Korea. So uh, you have on the east, look east, becoming Indo-Pacific. Uh, on the west, you have this reach out uh, to the to the Gulf, and then now, exactly like we moved, you know, ASEAN and then Indo-Pacific, we are moving Gulf, and then through the Gulf. Uh, you know, uh, when when the when the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, was here, he was actually talking about you know how he, you know provinces uh, or, or uh, you know routes which people even today remember, which were used by traders and the cultural impact which they have even today left in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, IMEC to me is is a kind of a analogous, uh, you know, uh, step forward, just like Indo-Pacific uh, was, you know, because the Eastern movement started earlier, you know, the, the Western, uh, the, the, uh, the Gulf relationships really started uh, becoming serious only after 2014. Uh, the, the other ones were started 20 years earlier. So you have the, uh, the Gulf, uh, leading to U I two U two I make and whatever holds beyond that. Uh, then you have the south southward movement. You know the idea of uh, envisaging the entire uh, ocean in an integrated manner, uh, and that then leads us to make uh, today uh, a much deeper uh, commitment to the littorals along the Indian Ocean. So. It could be, you know, on one side, the east coast of Africa. So if you look again at the last decade at Tanzania, at Mozambique, at Kenya, uh, you can see big changes in those relationships and big commitments from India. Look at the islands, you know, look at a place like Mauritius or uh, Seychelles or Maldives or Sri Lanka and then keep moving it. You know, then it moves into your, again, act east uh, at the other end. And the newest one, which is really uh, we are we are uh, trying to push for deeper uh, ties with the Central Asia, uh, but where we have historical goodwill, but we have physical barriers, and working those through those physical barriers is quite a challenge. Uh, and uh, you know, which is why, to some degree, the North-South uh, transport corridor, the Iran routing, uh, becomes so important. Uh, now we will continue because at the end of the day, I mean, you don't allow. Uh, the challenges of the day to defeat a larger purpose. So, uh, but the whole idea is really, if you envisage, you know, uh, India's interests and uh, engagement really deepening and sort of furthering in a way in all directions, that's exactly the kind of schema. I mean, each one of this is a policy which you would have heard of individually. Yes. But I'm giving you like a like a like a map. You also spoke about the new culture of diplomacy, and there are there are numerable uh, instances of, in Ramayan that you have referred to. Um, Sugriv's wife Tara, for instance, Angad leveraging his presence, um, Hanuman, of course. Uh, but this, you describe this new culture of diplomacy as having less inhibitions and greater coercion. And there's a very interesting coercion. coercion. And you said that among the key developments of the last decade has been the weaponization of the routine. Oh, okay, I'm talking about other people. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. I just wanted to be clear. Uh, you, you had me worried. Uh, uh, I, I, about, uh, some, I presume at some point we will also be using the same. Uh, no, no, we are nice people. <laughs> so. When we talk about the weapon, when you've spoken about the weaponization of the routine, you've also laid out what you call a new security agenda. The new security agenda, which 
looks at everything from, as you said earlier, who controls your data, um, who is stealing your uh, information, identity, to the older traditional security um, issues. At which point, how do we stop ourselves from becoming either a paranoid state or a surveillance state? Because the map of security threats to the ordinary Indian or to the ordinary human being has uh, increased exponentially. What is the role that we, that you will play to prevent us from descending into say a China? Look, uh, I would say that you are really overstating it in a way that the question has to be reframed to give you really a more accurate answer. Because, uh, it, you know, this is not a question of being paranoid. I mean, there are real problems out there. Yep. Uh, it's not, again, a question of surveillance. There is a certain responsibility that a state has. You know, we should, let's not confuse anarchy and irresponsibility with freedom. Uh, so I think there are, you know, uh, today good governance, uh, national security, uh, in a way, uh, international competitiveness, they all come as a certain, certain package. Now, let me turn it around. You know, look at the normal. I mean, unless you alert people, I mean, uh, uh, people should know today what kind of telecom system you have. You know, this, it should not be determined just by price point or technology. There are clear national security implications. As I said, look at the digital domain. You know, so uh, when you look at games and apps, uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at uh, uh, the, the social media usage, you look at uh, the, uh, the, uh, the digital activity that people do. I mean, you know, you, each one of us is putting out some part of ourselves. I mean, we are putting out often in cyberspace what we would not tell our near and dear. Now, if somebody with malevolent intentions is gathering all of that. Now we know that it's, this is not hypothetical. It's actually happening out there. So, so the point is today, you know, the, there was an era uh, where we looked at, in a way, uh, let us say broadly, daily, uh, you can say, transactions. From a I would say an economics and an efficiency point of view. You know, it was cheap, you liked it, it worked, you liked it. Uh, it was available, you liked it, you took it. Today, we have to introduce some filter of technology, some filter of digital, some filter of privacy. These are, you know, because these have all become very powerful tools. And the, the weaponization of the normal, because I mean, take something as simple as even tourism. I mean, if you, if you look at the last 15 years, you've actually seen tourism weaponized. I mean, I'm not even talking of sanctions and, you know, that's the higher end of it. You know, a country which builds up market shares has the ability, and as we have discovered, sometimes the inclination to weaponize it. So you can weaponize being a supplier, you can weaponize being a consumer, uh, you can weaponize by activities you do, you will not do, I'm angry with you, I will not send tourists, you know, I will not buy this product, I will not supply that raw material, it can happen. It not can happen, it, it does happen. Happened. Yes. So uh, people have to understand again, you know, when we think security, security is not just military, you know, defense of the borders. It's not terrorism, you know, countering terrorism alone. It is all that. But there is the daily routine, which is so susceptible today to manipulation. Uh, and uh, so, and this is growing. Uh, I would say, frankly, in many ways, 
today foreign interference in this country is chronic. So the uh, you know it's it's important for the again the average person to understand how the world is changing because if it is an era of AI and deep fakes, you know they've not come out of thin air. I mean they are today at a certain level there was a whole culture and a uh, and a process and a progress which which has allowed that to happen. Which is why we banned uh, 260 Chinese apps. But that brings me to the dragon in the room. How uh, as how do how does Bharat deal with a China that not only is resurgent but is a very different power from what we had imagined it might be um, that makes weaponization routine. How do we deal with a China like this? Look, uh, uh, first of all, no easy answers. And what, I mean, let's start with what we should not do, which is to posture. What we should do, which is to work hard. So I give a very, very basic example, which is the border uh, infrastructure. You know, after years of expressing concern about the LAC, the reality was uh, till, you know, if you looked at the border infrastructure, I know people drew up plans, there were reports, there were studies, et cetera. There were groups which met, which looked at all of that. And there are people in the room who are quite familiar with it. Finally, look at what was the capability you put out there? What was the resources you put out there? I mean, f uh, on the uh, China border areas, our budgetary commitment uh, till 2014 was below 4,000 crores. I think it's 3,600, 700 or something like that. I mean, today it is three and a half, four times that. If you look, you know, at road building, if you look at tunneling, you uh, look at bridge building, we've actually seen three, you know, 2x, 3x, 4x increases. It is, you know, if it was possible to do it in the last 10 years, why was it not possible to do it earlier? So the, the point is, you know, it's one thing to talk about, let's do something. The, what are we actually doing uh, out there? Uh, again, you know, uh, we talk about, well, you know, uh, they are exporting stuff uh, into India. Obviously, they will try their best. Answer is, okay, go compete. So you had a situation. We didn't compete against 4G. We didn't compete against 3G. We didn't compete against 2G. But you decided to compete on 5G. And when you decided to compete on 5G, you proved to yourself you could do it. So the, the look, the powers rise, powers stand their ground, uh, powers build equilibrium. Not by fancy statements and you know clever debates, but they have to do hard work of governance, put in the resources, push the system, deliver on the ground, monitor it, supervise it, have relationships which will contribute to it. You know, we we've actually not used international uh, relationships as effectively as we could have in the past. So it's a combination of all of this, but the bottom line is that there has to be an equilibrium and there has to be peace and tranquility in the border areas. And there has to be adherence to agreements which were arrived at. Because if you do not adhere to agreements, I mean, tell me, how would you have even the basic understanding about going forward? And if there isn't peace and tranquility on the border, how can any society look at other forms of cooperation when the border uh, is disturbed or violent? And there has to be, you know, eventually an equilibrium. I'm convinced it will, but I'm convinced we have to work hard for that equilibrium. You you spoke in, in that same chapter on China. You spoke about the growth of or growing comprehensive national power mm -hmm. as one of the ways. Uh, of dealing with China. Um, in today's world, when we are actually redefining the word globalization in so many ways, because trade 
uh, the way we looked at it at least a decade ago is no longer how we look at it. Uh, there are, if we are looking at an Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, there is a MAGA process underway in the US. Similarly with China, 2025, Russia, I presume, is doing its own thing. In this, uh, in this world, growing comprehensive national power and uh, to something that you also spoken about, the new globalization. What are the what are the attributes that India needs to grow, needs to develop, and how do we need to how do how do we go forward on this? Uh, you know, look, uh, I can only give you a few you know illustrative answers because obviously it's a very big question. But let's say if we believe that uh, in the next decade, there are some areas which are going to be critical economically or in terms of security. I think we should be prepared to uh, sort of make those uh, decisions, make those investments, build up those capacities, however difficult it is. Now, day before yesterday, you know, the cabinet approved uh, uh, the establishment of a semiconductor fab, uh, which an Indian, you know, uh, enterprise would do along with the Taiwanese, in collaboration with the Taiwanese one, and with two assembly uh, assembly plants. Or, I mean, these are the three are yes. kind of independent, or one at least autonomous of the other. Now, why why am I pointing to that? Because we keep talking, saying, you know, chips are very important. Everybody knows the auto industry slowed down when there was a shortage of chips. But what would happen, you'd read about it in Economic Times or Business Standard, and then you get on with life as usual. Now, if you today, you know, now all countries don't face this dilemma. You know, there could be a small country which would say, I'll take my chance, you know, the way the world is run. Anyway, my requirement is not very big, or I may not have a requirement at all. So, but big countries, countries certainly which have ambitions and which uh, need to be competitive, they need to look and make those what I call deep national strength uh, capabilities. So, I'm giving you that as an example. The same week, in fact, you had Prime Minister going to, uh, to uh, Tamil Nadu and announcing a second space port. Now, if you're going to become a space uh, power, you know, you can't live off something which somebody decided many, many decades ago and say, okay, I'll improve that 5%, 10%. I mean, we are looking for big disruptions, big jumps, you know, uh, big ambitions in different ways. So it will, I mean, if, as I said, if the world is going to be about AI and chips and batteries and electric mobility and renewables and green technology and clean technology. We'll have to get out there. And, and this has a, if you look at the backward linkages, depending on how backward you want to go. I mean, you can go all the way to, uh, you know, prenatal health and say, I want healthier babies, uh, you know, better education. Uh, joining schools, school retention, gender gap closing, better housing, electricity to everybody, water to everybody, roads to everybody. And by the way, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, if you actually sit and map out the last 10 years of all the programs and initiatives announced by the government, you know, every Abhihan and Yojana, you can actually see from pre-birth, to post retirement every there's a intervention to improve at every part of that chain that's what comprehensive national power uh, foundation is about because at the end of the day today a large part of the world we are moving into and i've dwelt at it at some length it's about people you know uh, look there are different countries every country will bring its resources to bear as its strength where this competition is concerned. Our biggest resource are people. So if we do not invest in people, you know, we do not do the skilling, the university education, the better school performance, uh, that whole chain. We, we are underselling our best resource. 
And really this era of a global workplace, this is, you know, tailor-made for India. If India can actually kind of, you know, get its act together and, and play it strongly. Uh, uh, one of the things that you've been oft quoted about, about it recently has been India as non-West, but India not as anti-West. Mm -hmm. As you go, as we go into elections, as we look beyond elections, um, what is the what is the non-West future for India that you can envisage? No, uh, look, we are non-West. I mean, that's a that's a statement of an empirical fact. I mean, uh, but not we, an anti-West. Because for two reasons. Uh, one is often confused for the other. And two, uh, attempts are often made to put us in that box, uh, partly as part of, you know, complicating our life with the West, but partly because others who are in the anti-West cause find benefit in defining us like that. So, and, and you see, sadly, a big part of the West falls for that gambit. Uh, so, you know, you have, uh, for example, say take BRICS. Okay, so it's it's somewhere you know it's it's kind of become like BRICS is anti-West. So anybody who's in the BRICS is anti-West. Now, if you you know, given how BRICS is growing, I I would suggest whether it's truthful or not, it's certainly not smart to define BRICS as anti-West because you are then saying the anti-West platform is getting more and more successful. So in our case. I mean, our, our convergence with the West and in many ways our affinities with the West are very strong. I mean, we are a pluralistic democracy. Uh, we, are, uh, we are a market economy. Uh, we, you know, uh, we, we have the uh, fundamental freedoms in our society which are not dissimilar uh, to that of the West, even if ours has grown up is much deeper history than theirs does. Uh, so, uh, I, I would say it's important even for us not to get drawn into this baiting the West and somewhere subscribing to the declinism of the West because that is part of the sort of the global mind games uh, which, which are on. We have, to, we have to differentiate ourselves as well because, you know, as part of the global South, I mean, because the West happens to be, in a way, I mean, this is getting awfully confusing, but the West happens to be the North uh, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the fact is, when it comes to a lot of development issues, we will, we will have contradictions or differences with Western countries. But there will be many issues on which we won't. And we have to get that balance right. I A couple of minutes left for questions from the floor. Uh, I can take a, a few. Um, young lady in front. Yeah, so we were talking about the change. You could identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm Akarshi Shavastam, and I'm a student from Delhi University. Um, so. Coming back to the question, we were talking about the changing global order um, throughout this conversation. And so do you think that uh, international multilateral organizations reflect this change? And uh, since they have a lot of leverage in the way our world unfolds, how do you think India should position itself to push for a reform in these international multilateral organizations? Yeah. Thank you so much. Take a couple of questions, Alex. Just, just okay. one second. Sure. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to follow up on that question. Actually, do you see a sort of changing order emerging? We talk about order, and there's what do you see as you see the next sort of five or ten years in terms of how that order might change? The young lady at the back. Uh, 
Okay, so my question is basically that uh, since it was mentioned that a large part of future is going to look like the past, um, history consists of a corpus of un a certain uh, a certain facts, and historians they collect them, take them to home, and cook and serve them in whatever manner they want or whatever appeals them in that sense. So in sense, it is often not objective or uh, without a bias. So in a scenario like this, how can we prevent the politicization of history or how can we not let it be biased in that sense for the future to be shaped? Thank you. And then your neighbors? <laughs> your, uh, your name? Your name okay, and... I'm Vaishu and I'm a third year history student at LSR. Thank you. Should you take one more? Or are you okay? No. Yeah, one more. Okay, fine. Good evening, sir. I'm Radrani Garg. I'm from South Asian University, so I wanted to know as to how are we going to relink the SARC countries, or are we moving towards more of a BIMSTEC organization? And also, how, is there a possibility of, again, reviving SARC? Thank you. There's a young lady behind this. Good evening, my name is Dukshani and I'm a first year student at Delhi University. So my question was actually very similar to what she said. So when we talk about Southeast Asia and India being a global power, how do you want to counter the narrative that India is seen as the big bully in the region? And again about SARC, is SARC redundant? You know, since we talked about G20 and BRICS, so where does SARC come into the picture? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, do international organizations reflect the changes in the global order? Obviously not. Uh, obviously not because, you know, most of them were uh, structured in a different era. And uh, they, you know, they continue with a certain framework, a certain culture, a certain momentum, uh, which is in a way to be expected. So the challenge uh, is very much uh, that uh, how do you get institutions uh, to to accept that the ground reality is different and and as i said you know uh, it's not just in international relations i mean you can have we have this even in a domestic situation i mean ground realities have changed but old habits as we often see apparently don't go away uh, so the the point here is uh, there will be a kind of a bottom up pressure there will be uh, in many ways, uh, an effort uh, by those who aspire strongly, uh, those who have the ability in different ways to push the system to try and, and do so. Now, a classic example, of course, uh, is the United Nations. Now, bear in mind, that's not the only multilateral organizations. You know, different organizations have actually undergone some degree of change uh, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, I don't call G20 an organization, but certainly as a as a mechanism or as a platform, the fact that it added on a member, a permanent member, shows that uh, you know uh, formats, mechanisms are not impervious to change. Now, in the case of the UN, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can see uh, broadly who's pushing for a change, who which are the countries who are, in a way, resisting it. Some are more open about it, some are less so. Uh, but what now has happened is what's called the intergovernmental negotiation process has moved to a point where actually different models of or different opinions about how there should be reform are actually being presented uh, before that group, which is uh, a step forward. Now, we, we're not quite sure what will happen after that, you know. But uh, the, the, uh, the reality, like any organization, government, non-government, commercial, if any organization is seen as really too rigid, too unrepresentative, too unable to, to reflect realities, there is then a cost to that institution and probably to the world as well. And in in many ways, that is that is what we are, we are seeing happening. So, if I were to move from that, because what the uh, British High Commissioner asked me is a, in a way, uh, a kind of a prediction of how I see that unfolding or not over the next. You said five years, but 
you know, when I, in a way, I look back at the last 10 years. Uh, I asked my colleagues in the ministry saying, can you tell me how many plurilateral groupings we have joined in the last 10 years? Uh, I asked them to do this last week, so I don't know this week's answer. But last week's answer was 36. So in the last 10 years, we have, you know, it could be SCO, it could be Quad, it could be uh, ISA, it could be IMEC. Huh? Uh, I, I believe the number is much higher, you know, so I'm, I'm sure the next time we have a conversation, I'll update you. But what does it tell you? It tells you that if there's a, a sort of a gridlock in the committee of the whole or the body of the whole, then you'll have groupings who would say, okay, you know, the four of us like each other, let's just go out there and get our business done. Now, we're going to see more and more of this. Uh, and so people who worry about, oh, oh, the world is getting fragmented, it's getting polarized, there's less consensus, everybody is going their own way, it's hard to manage things. Actually, all of it is true. And all of it is true because you have a conscious decision of some powers to gridlock uh, the, the, you can say, the top rung uh, of, the, you know, of the international uh, framework. So I actually, and independent of that, I also see a dispersal of power that, you know, I mean, we spoke in many ways about uh, a different mindset uh, and a different expectation of the US and a different responsibility of the US. I mean, if you again look at the last, certainly I'm saying 10, maybe even a little bit more, there's an enormous regionalization of the world that whenever there are problems, very often the, you know, countries who 20, 30, 40 years ago would have been far away, but would have moved in response to that crisis today are essentially saying, okay, look, let those guys in that region sort it out. And we're seeing a lot of that. So uh, we are actually going to see the world uh, in a way uh, uh, becoming, you know, more variables, more access, less predictability. I don't want to portray it as a kind of anarchy, uh, but definitely there'll be a certain looseness and a certain, uh, I would say, uh, consequent creativity uh, uh, in that system. It will lead to very imaginative diplomacy. You know, uh, I mean, for those who are nimble-footed, who are willing to, you know, um, take some bets and explore some things, you know, there's a, there's, this is a very, uh, it's a, it's a very uh, attractive world or interesting world uh, out there. Uh, but I, I do see it, uh, you know, moving away. I mean, when we look back at the next last 20, 30 years, they will look very humdrum as compared to what actually uh, awaits us. Uh, on the politicization of history, uh, well, I mean, we've seen politicization of history in this country. Uh, and I mean, uh, I come from a university which made its name uh, uh, and claimed fame uh, for that reason. Uh, so uh, the, the you know, look, the fact is, uh, yes, there is objectivity. Uh, yes, there is history. But there is also politics. And somewhere, how does one kind of get get a balance about it. I mean, I do believe that the country is best served uh, by, you know, people asking questions. Uh, I mean, uh, when you asked me uh, right at the start, saying, are you distancing yourself? I don't think asking questions is distancing. I think asking questions is healthy. I mean, I would hope 10 or 20 years from now, you know, somebody asks questions about what we as a government are doing. I, I don't, I think that's good for the country. I mean, what we do not need is the kind of, uh, you know, cult worship that we saw for many, many decades. That, you know, no, you should not ask things, you should not criticize things. Uh, there has to be uh, a certain, I would say, uh, 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 not just a validation, but a, 
uh, uh, desire to improve through revisiting and reimagining. Uh, but some of it, you cannot keep the politics away because politics is a reality. You don't want a depoliticized society. I, I mean, such a thing doesn't exist, but depoliticized is sort of unipoliticized uh, uh, in a way. Uh, on Sark, I'll take those two questions together. Look, uh, Sark is in trouble basically because how do you have a regional organization where one member does not hide the fact, in fact, sometimes proclaims the fact that they undertake, I'm using the most neutral words possible, violent actions against other members. You know, if we are to sit as a group, but you reserve the right to attack me at night, how long are we going to sit as a group? So we have, we have uh, kind of obfuscated this issue for too long. You know, we found excuses. Well, there's a constituency out there. There's, uh, you know, there's a reason for why they are doing it. The bottom line is we have to be clear in our own minds. You know, yeah, I mean, would, would, is, is it the view uh, that we should proceed with SARC even if one member of SARC actually has training camps, uh, trains terrorists, pushes them across, supports them in different ways. So it was heading for a crisis. It was just a certain succession of events finally precipitated uh, what happened. So if you ask me, do uh, you see a future for SARC? In some ways, actually you're asking me, do I see a future for that country? Because if that country doesn't change, doesn't really uh, let go of those kinds of options in its uh, uh, you know, uh, in its uh, armory or its toolkit, then it's not just Sark which is in danger. I mean, very frankly, you're looking at the state of that country as well. Uh, on, the, yeah, on are we, is it Sark versus Bimstek? No, are we, look, Bimstek was independent. Bimstek, and, and my sense is actually uh, the interest in Bimstek is, you know, we just had the Thai deputy PM here. Uh, I, I, we had been discussing BIMSTEC more deeply with the Bangladeshis as well, but other, other BIMSTEC members. I think there is today an appetite uh, to grow BIMSTEC. We know, again, it's not like there are no problems there. The situation in Myanmar is very challenging. But I, I would say we don't have the kind of issues in BIMSTEC uh, which we do uh, in SARC. There is a will. Uh, to cooperate, there is a desire to take it forward, but uh, because I fold into it the the other question as well, you know, how is India perceived by neighbors? You know, the big change today uh, in this part of the world uh, is what has happened between India and its neighbors. When you say India is perceived as a big bully, you know, big bullies don't provide four and a half billion dollars when the neighbors are in trouble. Big bullies don't supply vaccines uh, to uh, other countries when COVID is on or make exceptions to their own rules to respond to food demands or fuel demands or fertilizer demands because some war in some other part of the world has complicated their lives. You also have to look today at actually what is changed uh, between, between India and its neighbors. Uh, with Certainly with Bangladesh and Nepal, I mean, today uh, you have a power grid, you have ro roads which didn't exist a decade ago, you have railways which didn't exist a decade ago, there's use, usage of waterways, Indians, uh, Indian, uh, you know, businesses use ports of uh, Bangladesh on a national treatment uh, basis. So if you actually look today at the connectivity, the uh, the, just the volume of, uh, you know, people moving up and down, the volume of the trade which is there, the investments which are there, it's actually a very, very good story uh, to tell. Not just with Nepal and Bangladesh, with Sri Lanka as well, I would say even with Maldives. Uh, and, and Bhutan, I mean, I, I don't want to miss them out because they have just been consistently uh, strong partners. So our problem in the neighborhood, very honestly, is in respect to one country. 
and you know and in diplomacy you always hold out hopes that yes okay keep at it and who knows one day you know where what the future holds i think we are completely out of time and uh, thank you all for being a great audience but thank you so much dr jayashankar for an absolutely fascinating hour thank you very much Thank you.